most are unable to construe the manifestation of angelic host in varied form. The scriptures assert that one may be unaware of being in the company of angels, and yet visionary adepts are able to implore such encounter. Few understand the ritual of ceremony which can invoke angelic interlude, yet there are those who actively seek dialogue with these ethereal messengers, representatives of the Holy Spirit. Secrets can be accessed with such inquisitive appeal. They are waiting for those seeking to inquire in the purity of such longing. And still most are precarious in the company of angels, believing it beyond the scope of normal routine. Ignorant and dismissive, we placate such occurrence should it occur, relegating the specter of such possibility to the imaginations of inclination. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is FallenAngels.tv. Uh, thank you for joining me and for taking the time to listen to the show. I will today be speaking about the Order of Ancients, which if you have been listening to or have heard the archives of the writings of Abraham, they speak about how Adam, as being the first cast out from paradise, and the first modern-day human occupant on the earth, that he was given, um, the Asatir speaks about four books that he was given which taught him and made him a priest in this order and how he shared this information and passed these books down through the lineage of the sons of Adam, um, beginning with Seth, and then Enoch was one that inherited these texts, as well as Noah, and then Shem, after the deluge and after they were repopulating the planet and the earth was divided among the brothers the children of Noah and Abraham also was indoctrinated into this order and the writings of Abraham speak about this in great detail and they talk about how those that are part of this order, how they share all things, as did the Essenes, or what is historically written about, uh, documented about the this secretive group which had gathered together and hidden the Dead Sea Scrolls during the times that they were being persecuted. And so um, so we're going to gain some detail on this particular order because it lets you know, as is mentioned in um, the Emerald Tablets when it speaks about the gathering of both the order of light as well as the the children of Belial, the sons of perdition, how they created the different secret societies that were um, 
tied to the fallen angels and Lucifer as the light bearer, the order of the dragons and uh, the other ancient, you know, the, the Freemasonic groups that go back to even before the time of Babylon and Egypt um, to when these two groups split. Um, and this was even before the time of Atlantis. And so the one of the Dead Sea Scrolls talks about the war between the sons of light, the sons of the law, and the sons of darkness. And this is also spoken about um, with the enmity that began in the garden. Well, it actually began with the war in heaven and Lucifer's assertion to that he would exalt himself above the sides of the north and sit on the throne of God and to be like the the most high that when he had that when he conceived this thought in his mind that this is when iniquity was found within him and that he was then banished with the one third of the angels that joined him in rebellion for the war in heaven. They were cast out of the upper heavens and they took up residence in this solar system in this um you know in the this particular um, part of the galaxy and came to be residents here upon the earth and so this war has been ongoing since the garden with the birth of Cain and Abel and that this would be the continuation of that war and this war would continue until Christ comes again and separates the wheat and the tear the goat and the sheep um, the wise from the foolish virgins and so if you really understand and I know I've explained this in great detail if you really understand the what scripture is talking about as far as the the division of these two bloodlines these two lineages then it starts to make sense as to why it is that they kept such detailed records of whom begat whom and whom was born of whom and also why um why in Luke chapter 3 Cain is excluded from the lineage of Yeshua. Uh, welcome, everybody in the chat, son of Yahweh, and demolishing strongholds and Link and the other numbered guests and those that will come at later time to catch this show. Um, and the text that I'm going to be reading from is called the Book of Order. And it's not one that I have ever heard about, and I've never heard of anybody talking about this particular text. Um, but it supposedly was written by Elijah the Tishbit before he was taken up to, um, you know, became, um, was taken up to the heavens. Just like Enoch wrote the book of Enoch, as well as it says many other texts before he was translated to the heavens. Um, and so this is one of those texts. And I'm going to go ahead and go into it. If you have any questions, put them in the chat room and I will address them. Um, Oh, Link is asking about the, the music at the beginning of the show. 
Um, it's the song is called Flock of Angels, and the artist is Mo Leverett. M O L E V E R E T T, which he's a um, a friend of. Uh, he's the brother of a friend that I used to work with down in Macon. And yes, it's um, absolutely beautiful. I believe the album album's name is um, Sacred Desires. And as far as where you can find the link to this particular text, let me go ahead and pull that up real quick. so that you can follow along if you so desire, or read it later for yourself. It is located at the very end of the second portion of the writings of Abraham. And so let me post this link. All right. You can click on that link to find the text. And again, it's at the end of, I believe it's chapter 160, if I'm correct. Chapter 162 of the writings of Abraham. It's called The Book of the Order by Elijah the Prophet. All right, we're going to go ahead and get into this. Chapter 1. The record of Elijah the Tishbit, which he wrote for his disciple Elisha, whom he called from his field in Abba unto the holy order of God. Behold, I, Elijah, write this record with mine own hand, and no man shall see it until I have ascended into heaven. Then shall mine authority and the keys of my priesthood, which is the priesthood of the fathers, pass to my son, Elisha, by right of lineage and obedience. This priesthood came down to me from the fathers by lineage, for I am a descendant of Joshua, the son of Nun, who was descended from Ephraim, the son of Joseph, through whom the rights of the firstborn descended in Israel. These rights I received when I was but a lad from my father before he was martyred for the testimony of Jehovah. And according to the word of the Lord, I have appointed Elisha, who is mine adopted son, to be my successor in bearing off this work. Nevertheless, not all of my rights shall rest upon him, for the Lord hath said, Behold, my servant Elijah shall not die, but shall bear with him the keys of his ministry unto the heavenly city until the last days, when I shall send him unto one of his seeds, whom I shall raise up to bear the fullness of this ministry again among the sons of men. Um, uh, if you have not heard, I, I did a show a long time ago called Revelation, the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And I explained in that particular show with many different confirmations from several different texts, which point to the, um, my belief that the two witnesses of Revelation 11 will be Enoch and Elijah, and that because they were translated before they died, they will at that time be martyred in the streets of Jerusalem, killed by the Antichrist and allowed to, to lay there for three and a half days before they would be uh, resurrected and uh, taken up to heaven. And so if you're interested in in you know his mention here, um check out that particular show. Alright, continue. But he shall leave with Elisha those keys necessary to continue his work 
in organizing the schools of the prophets and the order of Enoch, that the sons of the prophets may continue to live after the holy order of God. Chapter 2. Therefore, my son Elisha, I leave for thee this book of the order by which thou mayest govern the order of Enoch, for I have organized and governed this order according to the revelations of the Lord to me, and under the direction of his Holy Spirit, I give thee these instructions. Everyone who desireth to enter the order of Enoch must be one who loveth the Lord his God with all his heart might, mind, and strength, and one who loveth his fellow man as himself, according to the word of the Lord through Moses. I would also comment that this is exactly what uh, Yeshua said of the commandments, um, that, you know, that you must love the Lord God with all your heart, as well as your neighbor as you would yourself, and that was the whole of the law as it was based upon love. He must covenant to live the law of consecration and to hold all things common with his brethren according to the pattern set by our first parents. For when they came forth from the garden, they divided not up the land, but held it in common until their posterity through wickedness began to lay claim to it for themselves. Behold, this private ownership of the property came to pass through the teachings of that evil combination which was organized by Cain, that men might set gain for themselves because the love of God and man is not in them. He who entereth the order must be one who is dedicated to seeing the face of God and receiving from him the promise of eternal life. We, he must keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord his God to do what is good and upright in the sight of God according to that which he commanded through Moses the lawgiver and through his servants the prophets. He who seeketh to enter the holy order of God must be one who loveth that which the Lord loveth and hateth that which the Lord hateth. He must keep all the evil from him and love to do good that his works may bear testimony of his righteousness before God and man. He must be governed by the principles of truth, righteousness, and justice in all he doeth while in this tabernacle of clay. Having repented of his inclination to follow after the dictates of the flesh, no longer doing evil according to the selfishness and jealousy and contentions, contentious spirit which dwelleth in the natural man. Every member of the order must be dedicated to bring into a bond of mutual love all those who are striving to live after the holy order of God. To live after the order of the ancient means that they must live in the community of God's elect, holding all things common and loving one another as themselves. Yea, they must unite in one heart and one mind, for only thus can Zion be built up in its perfect order, and the name of our God be glorified. Those entering the holy order must have shown by their works their desires to live according to all that God has revealed, to keep all his commandments, to perfect their lives according to God's holy order, that they may be sanctified by the blood of the covenant unto the renewal of their spirits and their bodies. They must love all the children of light, each according to his position in the house of God. For those who live the highest law are most able to be loved, and so forth, even unto the lowest law of God. They must hate the works of darkness, and avoid intercourse with the sons of Belial, each according to the measure of his guilt, for God will bring every work into judgment, and those who associate with the wicked will be condemned with them. Chapter 3 He who loveth the truth 
and truly desire to live after the order of heaven must declare his willingness to be united to the congregation of the Lord's elect and must consecrate by covenant all of his mind, all of his strength, and all of his wealth to the community of God, so that his mind may be purified by the truth of the Lord's precepts, his strength controlled by the Lord's Lord's perfect ways, and his wealth disposed of in accordance with the Lord's just design. He must order his life according to the pattern which the Lord hath given, observing the hours of worship, the Sabbaths, and the holy days, to do them, neither omitting the feast nor neglecting the fast of the Lord. This particular passage is really interesting to me because uh, in the book that I'm currently working on, it one of the main focuses of that text is making people aware of God's calendar and as well as how um, understanding his calendar and following it makes us be enables us to really determine what is truly Sabbath, as well as the holy days, um, you know, and their links to uh, Passover, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, the Festival of First Fruits, Pentecost, um, the a day of, of atonement and um, the feast of trumpets and the feast of tabernacles. Those those seven holy festivals and feast days, in my opinion, um, we should still acknowledge them. And my current book also speaks about that and talks about why it is that. Um, we should acknowledge. And when I say acknowledge, I, I don't mean in celebrating them or upholding or maintaining them in the way that is um, ascribed for us or for the Hebrew people to do in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Leviticus chapter 23 lays down all of these particular feast days and festivals, and they have been um, followed by the Hebrew people since ancient times. And um, and also, if you don't know, the Yeshua, when he first came into the flesh, he fulfilled the, the three first festivals um, because he was crucified on Passover. He was buried on the Day of Unleavened Bread, and then he was um, was resurrected on the um, on first fruits. And also, um, fifty days after, which if you don't know what the celebration of Pentecost is, Pentecost was when and, and is recognized and celebrated because it is the 50 days. It's the count of 50 days, and it equates to the Hebrew people being freed from the bondage of Israel freed from the slavery and the bondage of Israel and the 50 days that brought them to Mount um, Mount Sinai. And it was on that day that Moses was delivered the Torah, given the law. And this law is, you know, what the Torah is what the Hebrew people follow as the law and is the covenant that they share 
with Yahweh, Yahuwah, the Most High God. And it was also uh, 50 days after the resurrection of Yeshua that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and um, filled them so that they could go and deliver the message to all the rest of the world. And so these four festivals have all, have, were all fulfilled by the first coming of Yeshua in the flesh. And the next three, the tabernacles, uh, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Trumpets, those will be fulfilled by Yeshua's return. And so, because um, a lot of people don't know how these feast days, these holy festivals as laid out in the Old Testament, how they correspond to our current um, worship of the only begotten Son. And so once you understand that, then you'll understand why it is that we should still acknowledge the Leviticus 23 holy days. And so my next book has a lot of that within, within it as well. All right, uh, continuing. He must be done he must be one whose heart is knit unto the ordinances of God's law, who will strive diligently to preserve them in purity, neither breaking the laws, changing the ordinances, nor neglecting the everlasting covenants of our God. Chapter four. When such a man cometh forward to present himself as a candidate for admission into the order, he should be examined carefully by the elders of the community. And having been proven worthy, he must enter into a covenant in the presence of God, the holy angels, and his brethren of the order, by entering into the waters of immersion, being baptized, the waters of immersion that he will do according to all that God hath commanded and not turn away from the service of the Lord through fear of wicked men or evil spirits, nor through discouragement because of the trials which Belial shall send against him. For the Lord God of our fathers hath appointed that all who seek to live after his holy order shall be tried and purified until their gold is pure and their dross consumed. It was the same thing for Yeshua when he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. Um, you know, that that this particular baptism, this immersion, um, you know, is part of being of this particular order. And I, I'm going to check the chat room in just a few minutes, um, just in case you commented on the uh, the festivals or the feast days or anything of that that nature. When a man hath entered into this covenant in the waters of immersion, the elders of the community are to lay their hands upon his head and bless him with the Holy Spirit of God. Chapter 5. At the end of each year, every member of the community is to be interviewed from first to last that the spiritual standing of each in the community may be determined. This is needful so long as Belial continues to hold sway as the God of this world. The object of this interview is that every man in Israel may be made aware of his status in the community of God's elect, that he may measure himself against the perfect, eternal society of heaven. If any man finds that he is being governed by a law which is beyond his desires, then let him be placed among those who live after his own heart. And if any man will qualify himself to live a law higher than he is living, let, let the opportunity be given him to live that law. Thus, no man in Israel need be abased below his ability to qualify nor exalted above his desires to live 
after the heavenly pattern. And thus all members of the community will stand, each in his proper place according to a true evaluation of his standing before God. Let those who judge in these matters judge according to correct principle in profound humility, being full of charity and equity toward their brethren and sisters that the society of heaven may flourish among you, being sanctified by love and unity in the Lord our God. Chapter 6. Anyone who refuses to live after the pattern of God's holy order, the perfect society of heaven, but persists in walking after the stubbornness of his own heart and the vain traditions of his fathers, shall not be admitted into the community of God's elect. For inasmuch as he has rebelled against the discipline required of those who are called to set their lives in order according to the precepts of the heavenly law, he cannot be counted among the saints of the Most High. The spiritual, mental, physical, and material resources of such a man are of no value to the community of God's elect. Therefore, he shall not be permitted to enter into the order of Enoch to live after the pattern of heaven. If he were honest in acknowledging his weaknesses before God, then would the Lord make his weaknesses to become strength unto him. But inasmuch as his heart remaineth stubborn, and he repenteth not, he shall remain in his sins. Such an one looketh upon the light of God's truth, but seeth only darkness. He can never be sanctified, because the light is not in him, that he should be born again, a new creature in the Lord. Although he should offer numerous sacrifices in the similitude of the Lamb of God and be immersed in water any number of times and be washed and anointed after the order of the Messiah, yet he can never be cleansed from his sins except through contrition and repentance, wherein he rejecteth his former works and walketh in the path which our fathers walked in, which is the holy order of God. Unclean, unclean he remaineth so long as he will not be governed by the laws of God neither submit himself to the ordinances. He shall never enter into communion with the heavenly host. It is only when the spirit of man hath been awakened to the right of God's truth that he can begin to direct his life according to those holy principles by which he can ascend into the presence of God and make his calling and election sure. Only through obedience to those laws and that holy order which have been handed down from our fathers who entered into the presence of the Lord and held communion with the general assembly and church of the firstborn can a man sanctify his life to commune with the fathers who have gone on before him. Thus can the blessings and rights of the priesthood of the fathers descend upon the heads, and they shall dwell in the courts of the sanctified in time and eternity. For only through obedience to the laws and ordinances of God, walking faithfully after his holy order and enduring unto the end, therein can a man be redeemed from the fall, and gain a remission of all his sins, so that his mind can be opened to gaze upon the true light of life. I'm going to comment here and also check the chat room. Um, this is the whole reason for our being here now and at this time, is to return to our immortal bright nature, to return to our first estate, to become sons of God 
angelic and able to stand in the light in the presence of the Most High God and the Son. You know, both are the same. The Father and the Son are are are, are the same. And so, um, just like Enoch in, I believe it's the second book of Enoch, the book of the secrets of Enoch, when he spoke about what it was like. You know, I should actually read that. Uh, when he spoke about what it was like to be in the presence of the Most High God and how it was absolutely mind-blowing in that he it was difficult for him to withstand and to be there because he was horrified. He was terrified at being before God and being left on the seventh heaven, which I've got that here. So let me share that with you. I'm looking for the exact... Okay. Okay, here we go. And the Lord sent one of his glorious ones, the archangel Gabriel, and he said to me, Be brave, Enoch. Don't be frightened. Stand up and come with me and stand in front of the face of the Lord forever. And I answered... I answered him and said, Woe to me, my Lord. My soul has departed from me from fear and horror and called to me the two men who brought me to this place because I have put my confidence in them and with them I will go before the face of the Lord. And Gabriel carried me up like a leaf carried up by the wind. He moved me along and put me down in front of the face of the Lord. And I saw the eighth heaven, which is called in the Hebrew language, Musaloth, the changer of the seasons of dry and of wet, and the twelve zodiacs, which are above the seventh heaven. And I saw the ninth heaven, which in the Hebrew language is called Kushavim, where the heavenly houses of the twelve zodiacs are. In the tenth heaven, the archangel Michael brought forth Enoch, in front of the face of the Lord. And on the tenth heaven, Arabath, I saw the view of the face of the Lord, like iron made burning hot in a fire, and brought out, and it emits sparks, and is incandescent. Thus even I saw the face of the Lord, but the face of the Lord is not to be talked about. It is so very marvelous and supremely awesome and supremely frightening and who am I to give an account of the incomprehensible being of the Lord and of his face so extremely strange and indescribable? And how many are his commands and his multiple voice and the Lord's throne supremely great and not made by hands? And the choir stalls all around him, the cherubim and the seraphim armies and their never silent singing. Who can give an account of his beautiful appearance, never changing and indescribable, and his great glory? And I fell down flat and did obeyance to the Lord. And the Lord with his own mouth said to me, Be brave, Enoch. Don't be frightened. Stand up and stand in front of my face forever. And Michael, the Lord's archistrat, lifted me up and brought me in front of the face of the Lord. And the Lord said to his servants surrounding them, Let Enoch join in and stand in front of my face forever. And the Lord's glorious ones did obeyance and said, Let Enoch yield in accordance with the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to Michael, Go and extract Enoch from his earthly clothing. 
and anoint him with my delightful oil and put him into the clothes of my glory. And so Michael did, just as the Lord had said. And so um, you can see, you know, by this particular description of Enoch, how it's difficult to be brought before the glory and the light of the Most High God. And how exciting and terrifying it was for Enoch to be brought within his presence. And so, you know, that experience, our return to first estate, will be in similar fashion. All right, continuing. Only through obedience to those laws and that holy order which have been handed down. Oh, I read that part. Thus can the blessings and rights and the priesthood of the fathers descend upon their heads and they shall dwell in the courts of the sanctified in time and eternity. For only through obedience to the laws and ordinances of God, walking faithfully after his holy order and enduring unto the end, therein can a man be redeemed from the fall and gain a remission of all his sins so that his mind can be opened to gaze upon the true light of life. It is through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the Lord that a man receiveth the Holy Ghost, which will lead him unto true and complete union with God and all holy men as his iniquities are lifted from him and his mind is expanded to receive God's truth, that he may walk therein as one of the children of light. For the atonement of the Lamb of God cometh upon all those who are upright and humble and submissive to all the ordinances of God that their sins should be washed away in the waters of immersion and that and they be sanctified through the blood of the covenant and immersion in fire and in the Holy Ghost. Thus are they purified from all stain that they should be pure and holy without spot. Only such an one can perfectly direct his steps to walk blamelessly through all the vicissitudes of life, never deviating from the ways of God, but keeping all the commandments without turning either to the right or to the left, and without overstepping any of the bounds imposed by the word of God. Then, Indeed is he perfectly acceptable before God and a pleasure unto our Lord. Then will his joy increase and he will enter by covenant into the community of the faithful to dwell with the fathers who have inherited their thrones forever and ever. There's a book called The Ascension of Isaiah that Isaiah was taken up through the ten heavens. Um, or actually, I think he was taken up through the seven heavens. Um, and, but anyways, in that particular text, Isaiah is shown how we will receive our crowns and be restored to our glory be restored to our former state. And in this particular, I believe it's a pseudepigraphal book, but in this particular text, it details um, what will occur, God willing, and um, should we be counted with the elect, um, if we can aspire to such righteousness and being, by the grace of God, being counted with the elect and the righteous and be allowed, first will be baptized in the Arturusian Lake by Michael as those who took part in the first resurrection when Yeshua died, um, was crucified the three days that he was in the tomb when he went down and freed the the 
spirits of the patriarchs that were living in Abraham's bosom up until that time. He took them for the first resurrection to Michael in the third heaven, which is where paradise is located. And they were baptized in the Arturusian lake and then clothed in glory, reclothed in light, and allowed to enter into the the city of Jerusalem, which is the city of Enoch, um, which is the place of the righteous. And, um, and there they would remain, but no one will receive their crowns of glory until Yeshua comes and judges all and resurrects everyone and brings them all before him for judgment as he is judge and jury. So it's an interesting accounting of... Oh, also another text um, which gives great detail on what I'm talking about is called the Vision of Paul. And it talks about, uh, even from the point of death, how the the soul of, of humanity of a man or woman that that dies, how both the angels of perdition and the angels of light both come to claim this particular soul. And if there's any iniquity, any wickedness, any darkness found within this this being, that the angels of wickedness uh, the children of perdition, the sons of Belia, um, the tormentors, the angels of hell, they can claim him, her, and take them down to um, Tartar, not Tartarus, because that's the place of the angels, but Sheol. And if no such darkness or wickedness is found within, within them, then they the angels will glory, the angel choir will sing loudly, and they will be allowed entrance into the city of the saints. Chapter 7. Those who enter into covenant to hold all things common according to the order of Enoch and faithfully adhere to the order of the ancients should be instructed that their minds may be open to the vision of eternity and how the order of heaven can be established and perpetuated here on the earth. He who is called to instruct the children of light in these matters must understand and teach the disciples the true nature of man, the different influences which form his character, the meaning of his history, and the reason that God at one time blesseth him bounteously and at another time afflicted him dreadfully. This is the hidden knowledge, the application of which redeemeth man from his natural state and ushereth him into the holy order of God where he can be prepared to enter into the presence of God himself and partake of the fruits of eternal life. The Lord is a God of knowledge, chapter 8. But his word was everything made which was made, and he governeth all things according to his infinite foreknowledge. Even before he created the heavens and the earth, he counseled with the hosts of heaven and planned a plan wherein the spirit of every man should have his appointed role. For the spirit of every man appeareth before the Lord of spirits in the beginning and received a place appointed in the family of heaven and earth. Remember, um, in my seventh book, Skyfall, I speak about this and how in Psalms 82, where it talks about the council of the mighty and how we would all be appointed to die the death of man, this is that same thing, um, meaning in Ephesians chapter 1, it speaks about our predestination and how we were all um, 
to incarnate into the flesh, but that we had pre-existed, that we had been um, part of the sons of God in our previous spiritual life, and how and how we were during our spiritual being, and especially in regard to the war in heaven, um, how that determined our election, as well as the circumstances and situation uh, that we would be born into here upon this planet. So all of that is so very interesting when you consider it as far as the larger picture of who we are, why we're here, and what all of this is about. It really is um, a mind-blowing concept to consider that we are immortal beings and that we have been here from even the beginning because we were with and that there is no beginning because we were with the Father and the Son part of them before they even created gave form consciousness to the angelic host to our bringing we were as collective part of the fullness of creation that was God before we were manifest into our individual angelic selves, if that makes sense. All right, continue. When a man filleth his appointed role, it is according to the glorious design of the Lord of Spirits. And thus, as each one functions according to the divine plan, the work of God is pushed towards its consummation. Uh, again, this, you know, my whole seventh book has to do with awakening to remembrance, coming to understand who you are and who you once were before incarnating into the flesh, and that understanding that we are angelic spirits caught up in a fallen state of being, in a fallen form, but that because we are, you know, these glorious angelic beings, that we have special role, purpose, and mission for being here upon this planet, more so than just the roles we assume as being born into matrix and thinking that we're only here to find a spouse and to have children and to make enough money to leave uh, as legacy, you know, uh, an inheritance for our children. Um, that's that's a part of it, but that's not the real. That's not our spiritual reason for being here. That has to do with our a return to our first estate and with prioritizing the kingdom so that we can truly, truly come to remembrance on what we are really here to do. The designs of God cannot be frustrated in his hand, lieth the government of all things, and he sustaineth all the children of men in their needs, wherefore it becometh all men to worship the Lord God of Israel and be obedient to the divine plan which he hath ordained in their behalf. And so we are all called to a higher purpose. Um, not a lot of people aspire to this or even come to recognition of such, but the Most High God has um, a special purpose, a special role and mission for each one of us. Chapter 9. Now the God of the spirits of all men created man to rule the world and, world and set before him the ways of life and death, truth and falsehood. Thus was man made free even from the beginning 
to choose for himself the good or the evil until the final judgment when the works of every man shall be made manifest and each shall receive a just reward according to his works requisite with the mercy of our God. Ten. The origin of truth lieth in the fountain of light, the Holy One of Israel, while the origin of falsehood or evil lieth in the wellspring of darkness. All who practice righteousness are under the domination of the Prince of Lights and walk in the path of light, while those who practice evil are under the domination of the Angel of Darkness and walk in the path of darkness. Yea, the angel of darkness is the devil, that evil spirit who lieth in wait to entrap the souls of men and drag them down to misery and woe. He lieth in wait at any opportunity to lead the unwary soul into sin and error so that through his evil influence, even the children of light are led to commit those things which are grievous in the eyes of God. When men of their own free will choose to follow the influence of this enemy of all righteousness, they fall from the grace of God of heaven and must repent of their iniquities that the Lord can visit them in his mercy and redeem them from their sins that they may know to sing the song of redeeming love. All the afflictions which befall the children of men, all their trials, all their sorrows, result from the acts of this prince of evil. He and all his hosts are dedicated to causing the children of light to fall from grace and become enmeshed in their snares. Nevertheless, the God of Israel with all his holy angels is always nearby to assist the sons of light and save all those who will call upon his name from the power of the evil ones. The Lord God hath given unto man his agency to choose the good or the evil. The Lord loveth righteousness and will forever and ever and is always pleased with those who walk in paths of righteousness. But he hateth the evil, and those who walk in the paths of evil will be cast out of the presence of the Lord at the last day. For the Lord cannot look upon evil with any degree of acceptance. Nor can those who love evil dwell in his presence. Chapter 11. These are the fruits of the Spirit of God, enlightenment whereby a man can perceive the ways of God, to walk therein, discernment to know the good from the evil, reverence for the name of deity and consciousness of the approaching judgment of God, humility, patience, abundant charity, love of righteousness, vision, wisdom, trust, faith, confidence in the power of the Almighty God, knowledge, self-mastery, sanctity, pure thoughts, abounding love for all who follow the truth, purity, modesty, and the ability to hide within oneself the secrets of God which one has received. All these things come unto men in this world through communion with the Spirit of Truth. All those who walk in the path which is set before them by the Spirit of Truth shall receive help in their navel and marrow to their bones and shall find wisdom and hidden treasures of knowledge. These shall inherit eternal lives 
even the continuation of the seeds forever and ever, worlds without end. Eternal shall there be their shall be their blessing, and everlasting their joy in the realms of glory, for they shall be crowned with light and robed in glory, and shall dwell in everlasting burnings in the presence of God. Chapter 12. With the wicked it is not so. For the fruits of wickedness are greed, malice, falsehood, pride, presumption, deception, guile, insolence, unrighteousness, anger, folly, arrogance, lewdness, unchastity, blasphemies, selfishness, blindness of the eyes, deafness of the ears, stiffness of neck, and hardness of heart. Such men walk entirely in the ways of darkness, and all their works are evil, abominable in the eyes of God. Those who walk in the paths of evil shall receive a multitude of afflictions at the hands of the holy angels. These are the sons of perdition who are subject to the wrath of God through all eternity. Eternal horror is their end and perpetual reproach even the disgrace of final annihilation in the fire, for they shall dwell in outer darkness until their end, which is extinction, without remnant or survival. And after this, their lot no man knoweth, nor is it revealed to any man save those who are made partakers thereof. Um, this kind of brings verification, validation to some of the things that I've talked about in speaking about how it's my opinion that rather than there be a eternal torment, um, a, an eternal, you know, like the sinners have to eternally pay for their sins or or to um to never be given forgiveness there's a couple of extra biblical texts where i talked about how um at even after judgment that the prayers of the saints and the um the prayers of the elect to bring forgiveness to those that would be condemned to shield and that would be condemned to pay for um, their sins that are not apportioned with the, with the elect, but may not be, you know, total evil. Um, like the, you know, the, the, the Kings or, the followers of the Illuminati, especially the royal elites that involve themselves in um, the sacrifice and consumption of children and um, that are pedophiles and which start wars uh, or you know mandate um, the vaccinations of innocents knowing that you know that they will in, incur disease. I mean, those kind of very evil activities and actions which are instigated against the masses, um, you know, unjustified wars of conquest, invasion, torture, you know, as is being done by um, th these different groups, the shadow government, those kind of things are will and those kind of people will not be forgiven and that they will be annihilated uh, as if they had never been which is what the 
the scriptures talked about. And so, um, and so, in my opinion, this is justification of how I spoke about, you know, being cast into Sheol and being judged for your sins, but that the worst, especially Lucifer, the rebel angels, those that um, are of the most evil, they will be... Uh, I'll give you the link here in a second, Watcher Ruth. Um, they will be decimated as if they had never been. All right, for those that are seeking to locate the text that I'm reading from, go to this link. And it's the text which is right after the writing, the second part of the writings of Abraham. Go past chapter 162, and you'll find the order, the book of the order. You're welcome, sister. God bless you. All right, so I'm going to get back to reading this. Chapter 13. Thus, O Elisha, are the ways placed before every man that he may choose the good or the evil. This is man free to choose for himself. For the Lord will force no man to choose the right, and the devil cannot force him to choose evil. Between good and evil there is an eternal enmity. They cannot exist together in peace. But the Lord God hath appointed a time of judgment when he shall destroy evil forever. Oh, what a glorious day that will be. So looking forward to that day. Then will truth emerge triumphant and shall cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Then shall the sanctified, those who have been refined and purified from all evil and all the effects of wickedness through the immersion of fire and of the Holy Spirit, reign with the Lord upon the sanctified earth. Remember how it says that there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, and that the mountains shall be brought low and the, the abyss shall be brought high, and that the earth will be recreated in perfect purity and be flat and level, um, for the um, for the return of Yeshua. If you want to know more and read more about that particular, uh, uh, what I'm mentioning now, go and read the Revelation of St. John the Theologian, which is one of my most favorite texts ever. And it gives you great detail of how Revelation will unfold. It's called the Revelation of St. John the Theologian. I love this text so much, I included it as part of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. These have been washed clean in the waters of immersion and received of the Holy Spirit unto the cleansing of their souls from all the abominations and filth of wickedness that have having been made pure and holy, they might understand the hidden mysteries of the kingdom of God, those secrets which remain among the sons of light, being endowed with the vision of the heavenly order. These hath God chosen to be joint heirs in his eternal covenant, that they should inherit his glory. Then will the earth be redeemed, Death and hell shall be no more, and the men shall dwell in the presence of God, those who have been sanctified forever and ever, worlds without end. Chapter 14. Now, my son Elisha, having explained the influences which lead men to do good or evil, I shall give unto thee the rules of the order which all the members of the community 
of God's elect are bound to obey. All such as shall have declared their desire to turn away from all evil and walk in obedience to every word of God, according to the commandments which he hath given, shall observe these rules. They are to keep apart from the company of the froward, having not intercourse with the inhabitants of the world except such as is required in the exercise of their stewardships and the preaching to them of the gospel of repentance. They are to be one with their brethren in the community of God's elect, holding all their goods common according to the holy order of God and holding one faith and one doctrine. They are to abide by the decisions of the presidency of the order and the family council in all matters and be subject to the word of God as is delivered through his prophets, the patriarchs, in all matters doctrinal, economic, and judicial. They are to be united in all their efforts and always practice veracity, humility, righteousness, justice, charity, and decency, with no one walking in the stubbornness of his own heart or going astray according to the ideas of his fallible human mind. They are to unite their efforts in overcoming their carnal natures, that the flesh may be subjected to the spirit, putting off the carnal man, becoming spiritual in their natures. They are to establish truth in Israel that falsehood should be banished from among them forever. They are to unite with an everlasting covenant, forming a bond of union which can never be broken. They are to freely extend forgiveness to all who have enlisted in the cause of holiness and truth. Thus shall they become united as one man before the Lord our God, that they may be found acceptable in his sight. Chapter 15. Obedience to these rules can only be maintained through cultivation of the Holy Spirit, which is received in the ordinances of God's house. Everyone who seeketh admittance to the community of the order must first be approved by the presidency of the order. He must then enter into a covenant of God in the presence of his brethren of the order, binding himself by a solemn oath to consecrate all of his mind, all of his strength, and all of his wealth to the community of God's elect. He who maketh his covenant is to keep himself apart from those who have not received the ordinances of God's house, except when acting in the strength of his priesthood in the service of our God. Those who reject the ordinances of God's house cannot perfect their lives that they may be sanctified by the power of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, they remain in their sins and their pride being subject to the judgment of God. For surely he shall come forth in vengeance upon all those who have the, all who have the covenant revealed unto them, but receive it not until they shall be finally destroyed without remnant if they repent not. No man can be purified except by the power of the Holy Ghost which is received in the ordinances of God. Only thereby can men become holy if they repent of their evils. For without repentance, the reception of the ordinances is a mockery before God and shall resort, result in a cursing and not a blessing. Chapter 16. When a man desireth to enter the covenant and take upon himself the ordinances of God's house, thereby allying himself with the congregation of the saints. He is to be interviewed to determine his conduct in life, his relations with his fellow men, and his adherence to correct principle and the true doctrines of heaven. He who is found acceptable shall then enter the order of Enoch after the Aaronic order where through
true obedience to the word of God and the instructions of those who preside over him in the priesthood, he may progress from one degree to another until he entereth into the order of the Father, the holiest of all. Moreover, every member of the order is to be interviewed at the end of each year to evaluate his spiritual attitude and the performance of his duties. Thus, by annual and other interviews, the standing of each man in the community may be made evident that the righteous may be promoted by virtue of their increased understanding and the integrity of their conduct, while the froward shall be denoted for their waywardness. Chapter 17. And when any member of the community hath been offended by another or observeth another in wrongdoing, he is not to come against that erring one with a railing accusation, but is to approach him truthfully, humbly, and humanely. A saint of God must not bear hatred in his heart toward his brother. If the offender will not hear his complaint, then he is to take with him two of the teachers to reason with him. If the offender will not hear them, then he is to be called before the high priest and his brethren, who are set as judges in Israel. Thus will all disputations be settled in order without anger or emotion, that peace and harmony and unity may be preserved in Israel. Furthermore, no man is to bring a charge publicly against his brother, except he prove it by witnesses. For in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every charge be established. Chapter 18. These rules should govern the affairs of the community. All those who have entered the holy order of God should be obedient to those who have been placed over them in the priesthood in all matters, as especially those relating to the order of Enoch. All the elect are to eat at a common table, assemble at every appointed time to worship the Lord their God, and attend all councils to which they are invited. They are to attend the schools of the priesthood, where they can be instructed in the order of heaven. They are to neither eat nor drink that which hath not been blessed and sanctified. They shall assemble at sunrise, high noon, and sundown to praise the Lord their God and worship before his throne. They shall meet together often to study the word of God and share the word of life. Chapter 19. The council of the order is to be conducted according to the laws of God. Every member is to have an equal opportunity to give his opinion in the council. No one, however, is to interrupt while his brother is speaking, not to speak until he is finished. Everyone is to speak in turn as he is called upon. No one is to speak on any subject which is not the concern of that council. Thus, by reasoning together, will the council determine the will of God that all things in the order may be done to the glory of God of Israel. Chapter 20. Regarding the teaching of this order, O Elisha, no one is to engage in discussion or disputation with another concerning the law of God, nor is it to be discussed with those who are not sincerely seeking the truth. With those, however, that have chosen the right path, everyone is to discuss matters pertaining to the knowledge of God's truth and of his righteous judgments. The purpose of such discussions is to guide the minds of the members of the community to give them insight into God's hidden wonders and truth and to bring them to walk blamelessly each with his neighbor in harmony with all that has been revealed. To them. For this life is a time of preparation for meeting the Lord in a time when the elect must be careful not to mingle with the wicked lest they be led to turn aside from the way through the cunning craftiness of the evil ones. Um, this will be the last chapter that I read.
today. And we'll finish up this text next week. Chapter 21. Thus must the elect be careful to live by every word of God. Say unto those who are seeking the inner, ver inner vision in these dark days, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let mine elect keep no fellowship with the world, for all their ways are evil before me. Leave them to pursue their wealth and profit, for they are slaves to their desires. Be ye zealots, zealous to carry out every covenant and commandment which ye have received in the ordinances of mine house, or ye shall be in the power of the devil, and surely it shall be hard for you at the judgment bar. Faithfully exercise your stewardships according to the holy order of God which I have revealed unto you. Accept willingly whatever may befall you, for I, the Lord, have all things in mine hand, and take your pleasure in nothing but according to the will of God. Speak only that which is acceptable before your God, and lust not after anything which I have not commanded. Then shall your reward be sure, and ye shall stand at the judgment bar without fear. Amen. I can read one more. Chapter 22. Now, Elisha, my son, I shall soon leave to join my father Enoch, whose city I have sought all my days. But I shall leave with thee the keys which are necessary for thee to do the work which the Lord hath appointed, appointed thee. My mantle also shall fall upon thee, and the pure in heart will know thy voice and will follow thee. Farewell, my son. May the grace of God attend thee all the days, and may the peace of God be in thine heart. Amen. All right. We actually made it through that text. Um, there's a there's one following. It's called the testimony of Mary, and so we'll pick up with that text next week. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed the Order of Ancients. Uh, I think that uh, if we could live and abide by the you know the regulations, the mandates of what is spoken about that really none of us would have anything to fear or anything to worry about, that we would utilize this life, this journey, to ready ourselves, to prepare ourselves for the eternal life to come, and that we would prove ourselves worthy to be truly counted among the elect, uh, I see that um, link. I don't know why. It should be. Uh, let me check because uh, otherwise I got it from somewhere else. Absolutely right. Um, I must have got this text from somewhere else. And so I, I'll try to find it, and then I'll post it in the description of this particular show. Um, I, you know, I, I, I save all the texts that I find because I know that so many times they will get deleted or that, you know, whole websites get wiped out. And so came across this particular text and um, we'll pick up next week with that other text that I had made mention of. I, I forget where I located this particular book. I, I've got, I can't even tell you how many I have saved. I should probably at some point, if I ever get time, compile them into one huge collection and publish them so that those that are interested can have all of them before. And maybe I'll do that at some point um, if I get the time. I pray that, you know, all of us have um, time to to do the things which we are called to do. I thank all of you for joining me.
listening to the show. I pray that the the Most High lead you in truth and revelation and help you to come to discernment, which would make you aware of who you truly are, why you're truly here, and what all of this is truly all about. In Yeshua and Yahuwah's name I pray. Um, until next time, God bless all. Good night.